Hello, and welcome back to The Path. My guest today is Don Ray Colgan. Don started out as a traditional karateka and moved on into full contact fighting. She has fought for Canada and has won national level bouts. In this episode, we talk about diet, training, and what it was like to make that transition between karate and full contact fighting. So without further ado, let's get into the interview. Well, thank you for uh, agreeing to do this, uh, Don. Uh, <clears throat> for people who might not know who you are, maybe give us a background on your training history. Okay. Um, my name uh, is Don Colgan, previously Don Johnson. Uh, in 1989, I started to train with Perry Campbell back in Sudbury, Ontario, back on, on uh, Pine Street. Um, you were one of the showdowns when I first started uh, my training and um, it was, I was more or less hooked from day one. Um, you're looking for more or less training history? Or yeah, like uh, and then what happened after you, uh, you, you, how long did you train with uh, Perry Sensei? Uh, I trained with Perry Sensei for, I'm going to say... I'm going to say a good 10 to 15 years. Um, I was about, about 16 when I started. When I started, I'm just giving you my age now. Um, from there, I trained under John Cole for uh, a few years. And then I got married and had a family and, and kind of backed away from martial arts altogether to do um, my the shift of my life focused. Um, when my daughter resumed um, school. When she went to school, she was about four or five. I uh, left karate, so to speak, um, although you never really leave it, but I, I took up kickboxing. I started with Muay Thai uh, at a local club here in Sudbury, and I had my first competition. My first competition was actually at uh, Canadian Nationals. Um, I managed to secure a national title for my first fight, um, and from there, it just uh, it escalated from Muay Thai to full contact K1 kickboxing and low kick kickboxing. Um, so how did you find the transition between uh, karate and going into Muay Thai fighting? Um, you, you know what? I had a little bit of a, a struggle. I, I really, really did. I had this. I had this image in my mind of what sparring would really be and what boxing would be and that oh I'll be okay because I've always had you know great big training partners like yourself to uh to kind of to guide me and to um to make me strong um once I put on the gloves I found number one that gloves disabled me I was almost paralyzed with fear to have gloves on uh to this day I tell people that um my my speed is increased without gloves and I actually have better accuracy in terms of not hitting people without gloves on. Gloves actually make me hit harder. Um, I found the transition to be very difficult. My first few sparring experiences, I, um, I could say that I had my ass handed to me, even though I was already a black belt. Uh, my ass was handed to me by people now um, who are maybe would not look at me in the same light. It was not, uh, it would not be the same experience. I think I cried a couple of times in my first few sparring experiences because I was so frustrated. Um, however, uh, I think that my karate and my background, you'll, that will never leave me. Uh, those staples and foundations have been the key to my success. I've always been able to use my karate. I've always had strong blocking, strong uh, in boxing, they call it parrying. I've always had strong front kicks that have always, um, they've, they've been my success. They've been my tools, my go-to things that when I'm, when I'm threatened, that's where I go. So what made you decide to, uh, <laughs> go into like full contact, uh, sparring? I, I really don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the style of karate that we did, uh, as opposed to Canadian sport karate, um, the, the style of karate that we did, or uh, that we do, it um, it's a no-nonsense kind of style. And 
I don't have a problem with people hitting me. I really don't have a problem standing there. You guys, uh, I, I call every, I'll call all of you my karate brothers. Um, you guys trained me to be able to stand there and withstand the storm. So for me to lace on gloves and to stand in front of a, a girl, you know, another woman, that was a whole other thing uh, where I wasn't intimidated. I wasn't intimidated easily. Someone would hit me. I would be very comfortable in that pocket letting someone hit me because I knew what my body could withstand. Um, I had trouble actually hitting people more than once, believe it or not. I would only want to hit people one time. <laughs> and I had to learn to develop multiple combinations of several strikes. And I had to learn that it was not necessarily a one strike finish situation. Whereas there, there have been situations where I've landed one strike and it's been over. Um, but I had, I had to learn a different game. So how long did it take before like uh, you start training in, in full contact fighting and how, how long was the transition to going and doing your first like uh, proper competition? Uh, I'll say that I, I trained a good eight months. It took me a while to learn how to, uh, to learn the different kicks. It took me a while to learn to wrap my head around having my hands bound. Um, you know, as, as, you know, with our background, I would strike with several parts of my hands, you know, or my wrist or just different. Uh, it's a different style, uh, so to speak. So I I'm going to say that I trained about eight months. Um, pretty much every day I lost 30 pounds. Every time I compete, I would lose 25 to 30 pounds uh, to to be able to compete at that weight category. Um, I was I was fortunate enough that my first experience as a novice fighter going into a national championship, there was only one other competitor. I managed to secure the win, uh, I believe it was about a minute into the second round, uh, the fight was called off. So um, transition wise, I'm still transitioning. I still uh, have a lot of room to grow and a lot to learn. I don't, I don't fight anymore at the amateur level. I don't fight at all. I've now retired, but I'm, I still train to keep my skills sharp and I'm still like a kid in a candy store when I learn something new or when I go into a new environment and, and learn a different way to do things. And uh, how many of those uh, competition level fights have you had? Uh, in total, I've had 11 fights. Uh, that is all I've had. Um, so I've had, I've been a national champion a few times a Canadian national champion. I've been a provincial champion a few times. I've had uh, I've had a couple experiences where I've been on actual shows where people buy tickets to go watch you fight. Um, that wasn't my favorite type of experience, however. I preferred um, more of a calmer environment. Maybe it's not as predictable, but it's a calmer environment in terms of the crowd. Um, from there, my last national championships, um, I, I think it was about my fifth or sixth fight, but from my fifth or sixth fight, I went to worlds, my first world championships for team Canada. Uh, we went to Brazil and I, I fought, um, my first international level fight against someone with hundreds of fights. I had no idea. I knew they had experience. But I had no idea I would be fighting someone. Uh, not only does she have hundreds of fights, she's pro. And this this is what happened from there. From there on, is that I I managed to secure a spot on the national team three other times, and I went to four other world championships. And how did those uh, experiences work out for you? Well, you know what, the first one I um, for a girl going in, you know, from this little town in Sudbury, Ontario. I um, I didn't lose badly. I didn't win. I went all three rounds with a girl that has hundreds of fights. This woman, she's a pro fighter. Um, it uh, I felt in my heart that I left everything in the ring for my first fight, international level. I wish it would have been a different outcome. My second fight um, at Worlds was in... Uh, we went to Serbia. My coach and I went to Serbia. We were the only Canadians in Serbia. 
and that fight I actually uh, I I won the first one. I went up a weight division, and uh, the second fight I lost, but I medaled bronze at that one. So I was um, I hit the podium at Worlds, which for myself was an outstanding accomplishment, which I'm very very proud of. Um, that same year, I went to Italy, or sorry, not Italy, uh, Ireland, and um, I attempted. Uh, I have to laugh at the experience. I attempted to do a light contact fight. And um, we, we learned a valuable lesson that day that uh, although I uh, am diverse in the many arts that I, I can do, light contact is probably not one of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was a good experience. I didn't medal. I didn't win. And um, I never attempted that again. And uh, my, my last fight, which I just retired from in 2017, was uh, in Budapest. And I didn't medal at that one, um, but for my age, seeing that I was 43 years old when I went in, fighting someone who was a previous champion in another discipline, uh, athlete of the year in Croatia, in her 20s, in her prime, I, uh, I think I'm just happy to be able to get there. Did you uh, experience any any serious injuries from fighting? or? Um, yes and no. So I'm certain I broke my nose. I've had the black eyes and uh, and things like that. For me, they're just battle scars, though. Um, I do have a knee injury where I've had, you know, a torn MCL. I tore it twice. It's been braced. Um, I have had broken toes. You know, broke. I'm sure you have as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, just things that come with the trade. This is what we do. So you have a black eye. Guess what? That's fighting. You know, you've uh, had fat lips and bled in the ring. That's fighting. It happens. So when you're training for something like that, is it um, like how much like actual like contact sparring would you do for training for something like that? I couldn't yeah. imagine getting hit all the time for like, I, I don't mind getting hit, but getting hit constantly every day would kind of irritate me. Uh, it takes a while to get the head for it because what happens is your emotions kick in. So if someone square hauls off, punches you in the face, your emotions kick in, whether you want them to or not, you automatically, you want to retaliate, right? You want to, you want to hurt that person because now they've hurt you. And especially if you weren't expecting it. And if maybe you had thought that you had the upper end starting off, um, it, it just kind of comes with it. It's You have to love what you do. I've never loved fighting. I've never loved it, but I've always loved training. I've always loved the uh, the training camp and the preparation, and I say die on the mats. I, um, I, I do follow the the mentality that more more sweat and training and more blood on the mats, so to speak, just makes me a better prepared athlete when I go and do what I have to do. Uh, and when I go in, if I if I had those excellent training partners that stressed me and that didn't intend to hurt me, but maybe hurt me, um, they were only making me stronger in the end. It was only building my my fight character. So, what kind of um, what what would your training look look like before going into like a, a competition? Uh, okay, so for example, uh, an international level competition where I would have to travel. So my walking weight is anywhere between 175 to 180 pounds. So, and this is just every day, you know, eat what you like, drink what you like, you know, live like a normal, a normal person. Um, about three months out, what will happen is I will have to take a leave of absence from work. So I've been very fortunate. I, um, I have a really great employer and it's in my collective agreement that an athlete fighting at this level on an international level team representing our country, I've been able to have paid leave from work. So what will happen from there is I'll, I'll back away from work. Um, my boxing will be two to three times a week. Uh, I will be running up to five to 10 kilometers every day or possibly every second day, depending on how my weight drops. I go on a total diet overhaul. 
where I eat at regimented times and specific uh, macros I'm, I'm within each meal. So I'm eating my proteins, my carbs, my fats. Uh, sleep is all pretty much timed. I know when I need to train, when I need to nap, you know, when I need to sleep at night. Unfortunately, my family has always kind of suffered for what I do. I'm, I'm very, very fortunate that I have, uh, we have a 16 year old daughter and my husband understands the process and he supports the process. My husband is a Red Seal chef, so he's able to, to prep most of my meals and he's able to make sure that that food is in the fridge so I don't have to come home and, and start cooking and meal prepping and thinking. I just know that my 25 grams of protein is there and that my carbs are there and my fats are there and I just have to eat it and then worry about recovery. Um, my last camp, I had to travel quite a bit to get um, that high level training that I needed. So I spent the majority of my last camp in Toronto at Bazooka uh, Kickboxing and MMA. Um, I, I was really, really lucky that their coach kind of embraced me and uh, took me in as one of their own, their own team and uh, coached me right up until pretty much the day that I flew out. And do you do anything special for traveling? Do you have to like pack all your meals and make sure you have like, what's that? <laughs> I do. Yeah. <laughs> I um when I pack my suitcase, my first priority is food. Um, going to these competitions, so it's not me and two hundred other athletes. The two hundred other athletes, that would just be the Russian team alone. <laughs> it's me and maybe three or four thousand other athletes. So all of these countries are bringing uh, their national teams to try to secure this. Unfortunately, when you medal. Uh, at Worlds as a Canadian, you don't come home to any actual sponsorship or any actual carding. Like there's there's no financial benefit other than your community that, come, you know, they all support you and rally behind you. And they have um, usually some kind of, in, usually something at the airport for you or, you know, when you get home, there's a big dinner, uh, which is all fantastic. However, when someone from, uh, for example, uh, Poland or Russia or any of these countries comes home with a medal, uh, say, for example, a gold medal, uh, a belt, or they come home with, you know, a silver or bronze, there is some type of um, monetary donation or sponsorship that goes back into that athlete so that they can maintain that level of training. I come home, I take a week, and then I go back to work. <laughs> and trust me, they, there's all kinds of work waiting for me when I get back. Um, it's uh, when, I, when I pack my suitcase, I usually make sure all of my food uh, that I can possibly bring. So I bring a lot of protein bars. I bring all my protein powders. Um, I bring all my nuts or anything that I might possibly need to snack on. There's no guarantee that the quality of food will be what I need it to be in order to not end up sick. That's my main concern. We weigh in, um, we'll get off the plane, we weigh in approximately two to three hours when we're off the plane and then there's a, about two to three days to acclimatize to the temperature, uh, maybe there's some barometric things happening. The, the plane in itself and traveling can do strange things to your body. Uh, different temperatures. Um, so people can gain 10 pounds within three or four days getting off the plane. So what happens is there's two to three days to acclimatize and then you weigh in again the day of your fight. This eliminates that water manipulation um, that many amateur athletes do and even even the pro athletes they'll lose 20 pounds of water in the sauna or whoever they they choose to do it to weigh in to make weight and then they they bring their weight back up for their fight. At Worlds, that can't happen. It, it's very, very difficult. <clears throat> so do you follow a particular um, meal plan? Like, uh, or is it just, you're just concerned about your macros? And I, I just kind of know what works for me. I've never really been one to, um, to embrace the paleo diet or the Mediterranean diet or, or anything like that. I just... I know what works for me. I know how to get my body fat really low. Um, and I, mind you, as I age, it's become quite a bit more difficult. Um, 
and I'm, I have to say, I'm, I'm really happy that I don't have to do that anymore. (laughs) (laughs) Um, it's, uh, everybody's different when it comes to weight gain and weight loss. So there's not a exact science, especially when dealing with female athletes, uh, females, you have to bring into factor the, uh, there's hormones and there's, uh, there, there's other, other things that happen with us. So I just know what works for me. So you walk around at about 175, 180 pounds. What do you usually like to fight at? Um, the weight categories, I don't really think they're all that fair to be honest. So the highest weight category for a female, it tops off at about 153 pounds. So 70 kilograms is, is the highest weight category. If you weigh in at 71 kilograms, you are now an open weight category and believe it or not, that's a really scary place to be. So I had always tried to shrink down to get into that low weight category. Uh, because I wanted to avoid the really big ladies. There's some really strong 220 pounds, six foot five ladies out there. And they, um, when they hit you, it hurts. <laughs> it hurts a lot. So, but believe it or not, um, the worlds that I ended up meddling at when I was in Serbia, I went up to that category. I stayed heavy. I fought at 178 pounds. I had put on a little bit more muscle and uh, my opponent, she was they were both well over 200 pounds but a fit 200 pounds and i meddled at that one against amazons believe it or not (laughs) (laughs) i know who knew (laughs) what was the uh, lowest you've gotten your weight down to um i'm gonna say 149 (sighs) and when i was there uh there's there's pictures out there i've seen Um, some of them i think yeah, yeah, it's just all pretty much biceps and uh, and ribs. Um, when I was at that weight, I actually thought, oh, yeah, I could hit the next category, which is 143. And I kept thinking, oh, yeah, I can do it. You know, I'm just, I got to have the head for it. I can do it. And my husband um, kind of put his foot down and he said, no. <laughs> <laughs> no you, uh, he actually made me promise the last fight I dropped. And he made me promise when he was helping me, um, I had to lose a little bit of weight in the tub the night before. And he was, he was trying to help me get the water out of my skin. So out of the bathtub and he was pulling the water off of me before I'd weigh in. And, um, that was, the foot was down, the door was shut. He doesn't really say no to me a whole lot. Uh, I'm pretty blessed that way. I'm quite spoiled. But when he said no, it was, a uh, okay, (laughs) I'm never doing this again. So, um, you, uh, you know, teach, uh, you have a place where you, where you're teaching now or? I do. I do. Um, I opened, um, it's a funny story. So in my, my kickboxing adventures, that's what I call them. I, um, I started teaching women's several, several years ago, I'm going to say about seven years ago, I started teaching women through another facility. They, they asked me to run a ladies program for them. I have uh, an extensive background in fitness. I have uh, fitness certifications and that's what I did for quite a while. It was all I did was train people in, uh, in, in pretty much aerobics and, and things like that. And uh, I built quite a following in our little town. So this uh, this coach of mine asked me to teach, you know, run a ladies program, see if you can draw some of these people. It was a new school and it exploded. I had no idea that that many people would want to train. So I created a, a ladies program and I ended up skipping schools a couple of times. I went, uh, I moved around clubs. There's a little bit of politics in Sudbury, unfortunately. And um, so I, I jumped clubs a few times and my students followed. And then I was approached by uh, the owner of Troop MMA, uh, Professor Monkey Nanku, and he had he had said to me, more or less, why don't you go out on your own? Why are you teaching for other people? You have all the capability. You know, we obviously have a, a following. Go out on your own. We'll help you do this. So Troop MMA, they actually um, kind of took me under their wing and they showed me how to do it. They they let me open my own club. I called it Ona Bagaisha. Um, and it was actually you guys that uh, my karate brothers that helped me find that name. It had to be a name that would be, it would have to, 
be similar to me. It would have to be um, something that represented where I come from and, and my roots and, and my ways and things that were, that I'm passionate about. So I opened uh, Team Onabagaisha at uh, Troop MMA in Sudbury. And I was so scared to launch my ad. No one knew I was going to do this. And I was, oh, James, I'm telling you, I was almost sick to my stomach. I had the ad and I was about to push enter on Facebook. I didn't have any students because they didn't know I was going to do this. And within two hours, I'm going to say an hour and a half to two hours, my school was full. So uh, from there, I outgrew my space at Troop and they were understanding and uh, supported me in my move to where I am now. I continued to only train women. It was just, um, I never really thought that branching out and training men was something that uh, I didn't necessarily think I was capable of it. I didn't know if guys would want to follow this really strong personality type female. Because <laughs> I, uh, I, I'm i one of those people that if I have to say it, I have to say it. So I... Um, I trained exclusively just just ladies for for years and then it was one of the coaches at bazooka in my last training camp that said to me his exact words were why do you only train women you're here sparring half of the guys here and you're handing them their butts you're handing them their asses so why are you not training men so I came home back to Sudbury and I thought about that for a little bit and um, I opened Sudbury Kickboxing Academy a few months later. I transitioned my whole school, and uh, now we have we have fighters, we have national champions, we have provincial champions. I have uh, strong men training under me, training with me, and uh, I'm very, very, very blessed to be able to do that. So you, <clears throat> your schools, is it? Uh, some people don't like competition. Other people just like training some people will do both but do you have like a certain emphasis for your school or um we we embrace our recreational members so we have i still have team onabagaisha operating within my facility so that's always going to be a staple because i find that um what happened was i i, I ended up with these wonderful ladies who never ever ever imagined that they would become kickboxers and martial artists. Um, I taught karate for a little while, but it, um, there just, there aren't enough hours in the day for me to be able to train myself in so many disciplines and still work full time and have fighters. So I kind of had to have the focus change back to kickboxing and Muay Thai. So, um, we uh, we have many recreational members. People just want to come in for fitness and weight loss and hit pads, and and we can accommodate that. And then we have some that uh, they like to spar and they like learning. It's almost like they like that that pattern of growth where they can uh, they always have a new challenge, something new to learn. Like in karate, you always have the next thing you're trying to get to. Um, and then we have our competitors that come in from day one. They say, I want to fight. I don't know how to yet, but I want to fight. It's usually judged by the first time they get punched in the face. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody wants to fight until you get punched square in the face. Um, but I, I'm really, really lucky. So far, so good. Everyone that gets punched in the face, they kind of shake it off. And they're like, oh, okay. <laughs> That's what that feels like. <laughs> and then they come back. Do you, um, do you organize the training based on what they want to do or do you have like certain classes for more recreational users rather than the, the people who, or is it just all the no, same everyone is, everyone is together i do um i i so when i was when we were training karate um i know sometimes you would have to separate the belts you'd have to separate the white belts to maybe an orange belt and then you'd have to have everybody else and then maybe a black belt class um I, I'm a firm believer that those classes where Sensei Perry let me sneak in as a as an orange belt and go watch the brown belts and the black belts, I'm a firm believer that I learned more watching, even if I didn't know how to do it, I learned more just being around that environment and absorbing um, that energy around me than if I was only with people at that level. 
because you you don't really know what you can take it to when you're always working with beginners. Mm -hmm. So we don't have any beginner classes. We have everyone working together. Um, I have not forgotten the time and effort that people put into me. I've not forgotten how as a yellow belt or a green belt that those black belts worked with me. I've not forgotten how those championship fighters took time to take me aside and they could have easily ended my sparring session and, and had that ego to, to put me down, but they didn't, right? I've not forgotten all of those people that helped me get there. So I'm a firm believer that mixing our new people with our more experienced people uh, even though they're not at that level yet, doesn't mean they won't get to that level. And I also find that our more experienced people, for example, our, our competitors, when they are in the situation when they're working with that new person, they now have to put on a different hat and they have to think of a different um, a different way to explain. Or maybe they're like an epiphany happens where they're like, oh, that's why I do this. Teaching someone will actually give you a whole new perspective on why you're doing this drill that that way right it uh i have a pay it forward system and uh, do you offer lessons most days of the week or i'm uh, i'm pretty much there six days a week I, um, I go right after work. My husband, when we opened Sudbury Kickboxing Academy um, just over a year ago, my husband uh, also came to train with us. He had never trained before because he was never allowed. <laughs> <laughs> I had always kept it my thing. It's like, no, this is my thing. You go do your own thing. So he was always in jujitsu and, um, you know, and he has a motorcycle and does stuff like that. So um, when we opened the school, uh, or transitioned to a, a co-ed club, I, um, I I asked him to come and train. And so now he teaches some of our kids' classes. We, we teach kids. And I'm, I'm there pretty much six days a week. I unfortunately can't teach every single class. I, uh, I will burn out. But I try to maintain at least two to three days a week where I'm teaching so that I can still connect with my students. I've recently started doing some personal training with my students uh, to give them more of the full package of, um, you know, the, uh, the strength um, element as well. So it's, um, it's its own beast, but I, I love every second that I'm there. So um, is there a lot of, um, do you, <clears throat> did you do a lot of weight training? Let's maybe start with that when you were like a uh, training. I did. I did. Um, so before I started competing and actually kickboxing, I was uh, a Les Mills pump instructor. So that's a group fitness class where you actually train anywhere from 25 to 50 people at one time. I'm up on a stage and I'm weightlifting and they're more or less mimicking and going by my cues. They're uh, doing clean and press, and squat and lunges and pretty much a barbell workout. Um, so I've done a, an extensive amount of training. Uh, in terms of weights, when I would go to fight, I would take on personal trainers. I had, um, I, I myself was using uh, the trainers at the basement fitness and they would run me through not CrossFit, but a CrossFit similar. There'd be a lot of sled pushing and uh, a lot of tire tossing and rope drills and things like that. It, um, you need that muscle strength in order to be able to be at your full potential. And those exercises all sound like things that are pretty easy to recover from. Like when you do a sled pull or something like that, it's, it's taxing well, when you're doing it, but the next day you're not like completely burnt from it. Well, my, uh, he has made me cry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's, um, he's, but it was all for my, my best interest. Um, the sled pushing and pulling is not fun when you have a 220 pound grown man standing on it, <laughs> but, um, you know what you, I signed up for it. I didn't have a choice. You have to do it. No sense complaining about it. And if you're sore the next day, you just, you have to manage your recovery. Um, and so do you recommend that for your students as well? Do you have like plans for them and things like that? Or what do you usually recommend for someone who's interested in it? Somewhat. Um, 
I uh, I do a lot of the training one on one myself in terms of I have them in a class environment or I'll take them at an intermediate level together so we can run sparring. Um, I will also I. Sudbury is a funny place where there's a lot of politics and unfortunately not all the clubs will work together. Um, however, I'm one of those lucky people that a lot of clubs will still work with. I still follow that old school honor system where um, I don't want to disrespect anyone or wrong anyone. I want to work together and, you know, if I can help you, great. And if you can help me, great. So I will send my students to uh, a local boxing club here. I'm, uh, I'm not an international level boxer. So why would I try to train people to box when I know that I can send them down the street somewhere else where they're going to get that, that boxing experience? Um, I have set up training sessions for people uh, in, in terms of strength and, uh, and things like that. I've sent them to trainers at Good Life and, and things like that. Just recently, I started training people one-on-one. -on -one. There really aren't enough hours in the day. Um, I do have our fighters, when you're getting ready to compete, when they're in their camp, I do have them checking in with me daily with pretty much daily weigh-ins. I want to know what they're doing. If they're lifting weights, I want to know if they're running, if they're stair sprinting, if they're going to a spin class. I want to know all of it, you know. So I, I do, um, it is time consuming when you, when you have five, six, seven, eight people at once getting ready to compete. But again, we rely on our team system. So, you know, they help each other through things. They train together. They set up their training together. They support each other when they're fighting. Um, if one person's not on weight, you know, we'll, we'll all get on weight together. And uh, people are interested in training with you. Is there a way they can uh, access you? Um, most of it comes through our website and through Facebook. I do, uh, I get most of our message on Facebook. Most of the time our, our programs are full. Uh, we, it's not uncommon for us to have a wait lift, or a wait list, sorry, for Team Ona The um, The facility that I operate out of is small and I kind of like it that way. It, uh, it's set up just like a dojo. They, uh, they bow everywhere and, you know, they, they all do their, their cleanup after and they all respect the facility. Um, little things that kind of transitioned over from, from my background. Um, most of it is all, I don't advertise a whole lot. I don't, uh, I don't really need to. It's all word of mouth and they contact me through Facebook or they just call and they, they book from there. Um, well, I, I, I've seen a lot of Muay Thai, but um, well, what's the difference between the different, uh, you were talking about uh, the low kick kickboxing and the, is there like a, can you explain the differences to me or? Sure. Um, okay, low kick kickboxing. So, uh, how do I break this down? Low kick kickboxing encompasses um, a lot of boxing and strikes to the legs that are above the knee. So you're not allowed to bring anyone into a boxer's clinch or a Muay Thai clinch. You can't catch any kicks. Um, and I'm trying to remember all the different rules here. And there's, there's no sweeping. So I can't kick out someone's foot so that they fall down. Uh, K1 kickboxing, which is, that's my thing. That's, that's my element. That's where I love to be. Um, you... In Canada, you can catch kicks and you can uh, clinch. <clears throat> clinch is limited. It's very, very, um, it's limited, I think, five, six seconds, maybe one or two knees. Um, you can't. Um, you know, uh, Excuse me. <laughs> you okay? <laughs> uh, you can't use your elbows. Uh, whereas Muay Thai, you get to use all of your weapons. You get to use your elbows, you get to use your knees. Um, you have your boxing, you have your kickboxing, you get to kick the whole leg. You, a Muay Thai bout can last forever in terms of the clinch. If someone decides they want to be in the clinch and those two fighters are engaged in the clinch, they can stay in the clinch forever. And I'm, uh, unfortunately, that's not a happy place for me. <laughs> I really don't, uh, I don't enjoy the clinch at all. So I try to uh, limit my clinch to five, six seconds, get out, do what I have to do and use my front kick. Is anything, in, um, is one preferred over the other in uh, Canada? Is like... Muay Thai is, more... is based 
Muay Thai is really big. We have um, we have a lot of crews, which is a, a t- it's like a sensei. It's um, a certified teacher. Kickboxing, um, it's big, but I would say Muay Thai is probably bigger. The um, there is another style of kickboxing that's still around, and that's full contact kickboxing. So do you remember back in the eighties when there was uh, fights? Uh, where they were wearing the long silky pants and the little booties. Like Johnny Terrio, like that kind of era? Yeah. Um, kind of thing. So that's still out there. And at Worlds, actually, that is bigger than anything. That is a massive, massive sport at Worlds. Um, but for whatever reason in Canada, the kickboxing with the, the silky pants and the kicks above the waist, it's just not a really big thing. So we're coming up on uh, 40 minutes. Is there anything else you want to talk about or...? No, I can't believe I talked for 40 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess uh, well, thank you for agreeing to do this. And uh, um, it's good to see you again. Absolutely. Thank you so much for the opportunity.